Welcome to High Tech Heroes, a program which takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now coming to you from the studios of Foothill College in Cable Access Los Altos, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. Our guest this week is a prime example of what this show is all about. He's someone from behind the scenes whose personal contribution has advanced technology. He was employed as a main freight operating systems programmer before he could drive, and has programmed more machines than most people have ever heard of. He helped design and build the Plato computer system and its accompanying international network. Then he helped design, implement, and maintain the statewide network and systems for the Minnesota Educational Compu Computer Consortium. He single-handedly designed and built a network for the Atari home computers and was on the team at Packet Technologies, which built the hardware and software systems necessary to distribute interactive two-way data over cable television networks. More recently, he's been called the most valuable technical resource in Apple Computer's networks and communications department. And, in spite of all the serious contributions he's made to the computer and communications industries, hackers all over the country know him as a kindred spirit who still enjoys hacking just for the fun of it. And so it's my pleasure to welcome the best programmer I know, a true super programmer, Mr. Mark Rustad, to our program. Hello, Mark, and welcome to High Tech Heroes. Happy to be here. Great. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a small town in northern Minnesota, Hendrum, Minnesota, and uh, eventually went to uh, high school in Springfield, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And did you uh, start playing with computers in Springfield? Yeah, that's right. There were no computers in Hendrum at the time. <laughs> so uh, about what year is this? Uh, that would have been, uh, let's see, 1969 or 1970. And that would have made you about how old? About 14. 14. Well, I guess there are a lot of kids who have computers at 14 now, but uh, that must have been pretty young then. Yeah, and I was lucky that uh, the first computer I used uh, could do graphics. Unusual at the time. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And what was the name of that computer system? That was uh, the Plato 3 system. And uh, how did it do graphics? Well, basically it produced video output. And uh, there was a uh, long-distance video connection between Springfield High School and the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. It cost something like $1,200 a month just for the video and another two or $300 a month just to get the key set data back. But if memory serves me right, that's the capital of, this, of the state of Illinois. So maybe that's there correct. was a political reason oh, to yeah. do that. Yeah, the capital was just a couple blocks away. I see. We could see it out the window. I see. So it was probably a funding uh, venture. I believe so. The school certainly didn't have any money. Okay. And uh, so what did you do while you were programming that machine? Well, we did a lot of things. Uh, the thing that probably got the most notoriety was uh, when we simulated the login page to collect people's passwords. You simulated the login page. And this is very early. I guess this is, we're still talking 19... That would have been 1970, I think, yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's the earliest I've ever heard of that being done. So you simulate the login page, and then what? Somebody sees a display, they think this is uh, the system, and they type their name and password. And right. We simulated the system. People had typed their name and password. And then by queuing up a bunch of key presses, we would throw them back into the real system so they wouldn't realize they gave us their password. Oh, so you not only stole their password, but you put them back in the system where they should be. That's correct. And they couldn't even tell that you'd stolen it. Uh, the other thing we did is that we were able to collect passwords from terminals that weren't in our control. Uh, we were able to take terminals that were at the Champaign-Urbana campus and put them in our program remotely uh, so that we could get their passwords. Well, that's, that's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, you brought something along from that machine, I believe, didn't you? So we can see what technology looked like back in 19... 60s, late 60s? Yeah, this is part of the uh, terminal interface for the Plato 3 system. Actually, it appears that it had been used as part of the Plato 2 system beforehand. But I don't know if we can get this up here or not. That's a big uh, hunk of stuff there. It looks like about 200 transistors. So this is like one MSI integrated circuit now. So this is. Uh, yeah, if I had seen what was in this when I was operating it, I'm not sure I would have wanted to turn it on. Now, what, this was an interface then from what type of computer? Uh, that was from the CDC 1604. From a 1604 to what kind of devices? They were uh, storage tube display devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, there were 20 of them. Well, this thing is big and heavy. It's not quite uh, like the technology of today. No, there's a fuse missing back here, Sherwin. You've got a problem. 
Oh yeah, there's a fuse missing, huh? Yeah. Well, maybe we'll fix that after the show. So, what did you do uh, at Plato? I spent a summer uh, working as a system programmer on the Plato 3 system uh -huh. with the 1604. And that was probably uh, one of the most important uh, training experiences of my life. I really learned a great deal. Aren't there some stories about uh, high school kids not having access to the computer when they wanted, wanted to have access? That's true. When we were in Springfield, uh, it was very common for them to use our terminal to do demonstrations because uh, our terminal had the best storage tube on the system and had got the nicest display. Mm -hmm. They wanted the legislators to see the best, of course. This meant that uh, right. frequently our terminal wasn't available because they would hook up to our line uh, in the lab for local demonstrations. Again, they want the local demonstrations so to you, see the best. Were also. you good children and didn't, uh, didn't type while they were conducting their demonstrations? Or? Well, they had things set up so, uh, well, they had a switch. They would just turn us off. <laughs> I see. Um, where did you go uh, after Plato? Well, let's see. Uh, well, I graduated from high school and uh, went to the University of Illinois for a semester mm -hmm. where I continued working uh, on Plato as a student worker. By this time, I was working on the, uh, I guess it would have been the 6400, CDC 6400, 6500. Uh, so you machine. had worked on the 1604 when you were 14 and then been a systems programmer when you were 15 and then moved to a much larger computer. I mean, 60. 6600 family is a very, very powerful set of right. computers. I actually did a little bit of messing around with the uh, 6400 uh, when I was 15, that summer uh -huh. I worked uh -huh. there. And uh, then after Illinois? I finished my uh, college education at Moorhead State University in Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, there I had remote access to a uh, 6400 that used teletype terminals. The teletypes were a bit of a come down from uh, the storage tubes that had graphics. So teletypes meaning ASR? Yeah, Model 33 teletypes. Yeah. yeah, paper tape, readers and punches. <clears throat> what did you program while you uh, were there? Programmed, uh, well, actually mostly assembly language, uh, which is Compass on the uh, CDC machines. Uh, Fortran, a little bit of Snowball, uh, Algol, COBOL, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, BASIC. That's, that's quite a few uh, different things to write. Um, are there any stories about, uh, about uh, working at Moorhead? A lot of things happened in Moorhead. Uh, eventually a uh, consortium was formed to coordinate uh, educational computing throughout the state and uh, they decided to buy their own computer uh, to supplant the one at the University of Minnesota that we had been accustomed to using. And this is the famous uh, MEC? That's correct. Minnesota Educational Computing. Computer consortium. Computing, oh, computing consortium. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they went through a very contentious process to buy their computer and wound up with a uh, Univac 1110. Oh, well, that, that is a story that I know people will want to hear because this is the only time in history that I know of where the technical people had a technical problem with something and were at odds with the politicians. And as I understand, the techies won this one. That's one so, way of interpreting it. Well, I guess uh, we'll hear about that in detail when we come back after this message. This is what it feels like to have an asthma attack. It's like breathing through a very thin straw. Asthma is a serious lung disease that can affect people of all ages. The American Lung Association helps people with asthma learn how they can lead normal lives. Asthma can be controlled. For more information, call your local American Lung Association. It's a matter of life and breath. The American Lung Association, the Christmas Seal people. Welcome back to High Tech Heroes. I'm talking with super programmer Mark Rustet here about computing in the old days in Minnesota. And you're about to tell us about when they got a Univac. That's uh, correct. Uh, Mac purchased a Univac to serve uh, the needs of education all over the state of Minnesota. It was intended to be a very large-scale time-sharing system with, uh, I don't even remember how many hundred ports. So the state of Minnesota decided that they wanted their kids to be able to program. Of course, Minnesota's where Seymour Cray is from, right? That's right. So they wanted to have, I guess, the state stay ahead in computing, and they were going to make it available to all the high school kids in the, in the early 70s? That's correct, yeah. This got started around 74, I believe. 
Mm-hmm. 73 or 74. Okay, and they bought a UNIVAC computer to serve the whole state, and we're going to put networks over the whole state. Right. Uh, they had a statewide network so that very nearly every school in the state uh, had some sort of access to the system. Including colleges or just? Yeah, especially colleges. Okay. But all the way down to elementary school. And that sounds like a great idea. Did it work? Well, it was uh, good in principle. Uh, not such a great computer for that use, though. And why was that? Well, although it lived up to its con- contractual obligation, which was 90% uptime, uh, the contract hadn't specified a mean time between failure. And uh, the mean time between failure at times was uh, measured in minutes. This minutes. So what you're telling me is you'd sign on to this computer. I guess you'd wait for it to crash. Then when it came back up, you'd sign on as soon as you could, and you'd log in and get a little past login sequence, and it'd go down again. That's basically right. Well, that's uh, But fortunately, it would generally recover in just a few seconds, so it still maintained uh, 90% uptime, even though nobody could practically get any work done. Well, that, that sounds like meeting the uh, letter of a contract, but not necessarily the spirit of the contract. That was the way a lot of us saw it. Uh-huh. Uh, so what did you do about it? Well, a lot of things happened. Uh, early on, we uh, called in frequently to report problems, and we found quite a lot of problems. And Meaning that you found de- bugs in their system and tried to debug their system for them? Well, we certainly found a lot of bugs in the system. Mm-hmm. And uh, we called up and would attempt to uh, tell them about the bugs and how to reproduce them uh, so that they could fix them. And we always got the same answer from uh, the other end of the phone, that, uh, no, it doesn't work that way. That doesn't happen. You can't do that. And, so, so they basically uh, weren't interested in improving their, their product. That was our conclusion. Mm-hmm. And so after you know, a few dozen attempts like that, we decided that they really didn't want to hear about it, and so we stopped telling them. OK. Then what? Well, it doesn't mean we didn't stop finding bugs. Uh, the system was just riddled with them. Um, what are some examples of some, of some major problems? Well, even innocent students would uh, crash the system. They'd come in and type in their Fortran homework, and uh, you know, some bug in three-dimensional array indexing in Fortran would crash the system. And you know, the poor student uh, many times didn't even realize that they had crashed the system. So they'd come in every day and try their homework again and crash the system every day and never get their homework done and not understand why. So basically, you were a student in Minnesota, and you were stuck with a computer system that didn't work after having used the uh, 6400, I guess. Right. The University of Minnesota system uh, was quite reliable. Uh, so what happened to, to fix this problem? Well, a group of people all over the state, uh, a few, and a few of us in Moorhead, um, kind of ganged up on the UNIVAC a little bit and uh, tried to make it uh, fail its contractual obligations. I see. And were they successful? I, I believe uh, one way of interpreting the uh, outcome is that we were successful. Well, now, they must have measured this on a particular time or something. What happened uh, when, the, when the state went to measure this? I mean, it, it seems like they would have to have some acceptance date or something. Right. It passed its acceptance. Um, but what happened is the uh, quality of service was so poor that school administrators uh, all over the, the state were dropping the service, cutting back, because it, it really wasn't working for them. And in fact, one district. Uh, bought Altair microcomputers because they felt they were much more effective than the uh, statewide time-sharing network. At that time, I'm certain they were right. And uh, wasn't there something that they did to check the, the uh, performance, what, a special, special story that happened on a certain day? That's right. Uh, to uh, attempt to load down the computer, they actually sent a message out to uh, all the teachers in the state to let their kids out of class at a particular time. Uh, so that they could maximize the load. Um, it turned out that day we had gotten the password to the sys$dollar$dlock$dollar file. Now, now, how do you happen to get a password to the, I don't know what sys$dollar$dlock$dollar <laughs> is, but I, I assume this is like the high chief password or something. This lets you onto the It opens all the, the doors. Uh-huh. Opens all the doors. And uh, we had gotten it by just wading through uh, stale disk data. Uh, the UNIVAC system didn't uh, essentially didn't prevent you from doing that, and so we... Uh, so you're telling me if you use, if you use a, a sector on the disk drive or a file, you delete it, it changes a pointer in the directory, it leaves all the data on the disk, you go out and get it. Right. You right. create a file, and, and it's already in your file. That's correct. Okay. And uh, you, know, you find interesting passwords doing that. 
Um, so you found this this sys dollar d lock dollar password. That's right. Okay. And then what? Well, since they wanted to maximize the load on the computer, I decided to help them a little bit. And uh, so I wrote a program that requested the highest real-time priority in the system and then infinitely looped. Uh, the system had two CPUs so that I knew this wouldn't be uh, a fatal problem. Okay, so you only used up essentially half of the computing resources for the whole state. Yeah. I but took, only, only on the time they were going to measure it to see how. That's correct, yeah. I, I, I was a 50% load factor that day. Uh, the operators down the computer room kind of noticed uh, that something had happened because all the lights on one CPU froze and they didn't know why. Oh, and uh, they thought that this was a bad thing and they ought to find out what happened. So they took the system down at that point. So they took the system down during the middle of this measurement? That's correct. Oh, okay. And then? Uh, and, well, earlier in the morning when we got the password to the sys dollar d lock dollar file, uh, we changed it because it was too hard to type. And we had forgotten that we had changed it because that was hours ago by this time. And uh, when they took the system down, they were unable to bring it back up because they didn't have the password anymore. And uh, since we had been troublemakers in the past, they knew to call uh, Moorhead State. Mm -hmm. And the head of the computer science department came in and asked us about something about a password. And about that time, we remembered what we had done. And uh, oh, yeah. So we gave him the password, and the system was back up in a few minutes. Uh, I have heard that it would have taken four to six hours to get the system back up uh, any other way. Well, did the, uh, did the state then get the message that this wasn't, uh, that this machine didn't perform very well? Well, they got the message when people were dropping service because of its uh, poor reliability. I see. I see. But they were still bound by the contract. That's correct. But uh, since they were unable to pay for the machine with the reduced uh, service levels, uh, Univac wound up canceling the contract. Because the contract was, I believe they paid on a uh, per user basis. So as the users went, the payments to Univac got smaller. Oh, well that, that at least gives some feedback. Yeah. And uh, what happened? I guess eventually they lost the Univac and? Yeah, eventually the Univac was removed and uh, they went out for bid on a smaller time sharing system to replace it because now the load was so much less. Uh -huh. And uh, CDC won the bid on that uh, contract. With another small computer, a large computer? Well, uh, still a large computer, uh, smaller than the 1110. It was a Cyber 73. Which is really a 6500 by my way of thinking. Right? Yeah, same thing. Different okay, color so skins. It's a dual CPU 6400 and, and uh, quite a powerful machine. That's correct. And how many, how many stations or how many terminals could that run? Well, it started off with uh, around 300 and uh, was supposed to grow up to, uh, I don't remember the exact number, around 400 over a five-year period. Uh, within three years, we had expanded to uh, 448 ports, which was more than anybody at CDC thought that machine could handle. 448? Yes. So that's the largest time steering system for that size machine that, I, that I've ever heard of, and I used to work on those machines. So. Uh, CDC didn't think it was possible, but uh, we did it. And it's not special interpreters or anything, it's general purpose time sharing. That's correct, yeah. People were compiling. Uh, in fact, every basic program run on the machine was actually compiled to machine language and executed. So what did you do when you graduated from college? Well, I worked for CDC for a brief time and then uh, wound up working at MEC as a system programmer. Now, you wound up working at the place that you used to crash their computers all the time? That's right. Okay. It was an interesting job interview. Mm -hmm. uh, they were about to install the, uh, the Cyber 73 there, and uh, we, I remember discussing with my uh, future manager a, a bug in the CDC operating system that would allow anybody with access to two terminals to uh, hang the system indefinitely. And I guess they, they hired you because they wanted to fix this bug. Yeah, CDC fixed the bug, uh, but uh, still it was interesting. So what else did you do while you were at, uh, at Mac? Got involved with a lot of things. Uh, wrote an electronic mail program. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually had been doing that off and on for quite a while, but this was a pretty high volume one since it was the main mail program for the system. And uh, what else did you write while you were there? Lots of operating system modifications. We uh, uh, did a multi-user subsystem that would allow essentially a form of transaction processing, but the transaction processor could be written by anyone uh, even in a language as simple as BASIC. So you wrote something, a multi-user BASIC, 
which would allow now, could I like write a game and have people play against each other inside this uh, certainly this program? Oh, so it's it's reentrant or it's uh, yeah, shared code, shared code, uh, shared okay. code, and uh, some shared data. That's very impressive. That's very impressive. So, uh, what do you do now? Well, I'm uh, with Apple Computer now, working on uh, networking communication software. Uh, mostly, have been involved with uh, intelligent new bus cards for the Macintosh too. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And intelligent new bus cards are what kind of cards? I mean, is this? Um, they're cards uh, we have that have uh, 68,000 and typically about half a meg of RAM on them. And they function uh, in parallel with the main CPU in the Mac 2, the 68,020 or 30. So you have a 68,020 or 30, and then you have a 68,000 on the card? That's right. OK. And is there an operating system that comes along with this? Or do I, does everybody have to write their own code? Uh, no. I was one of the co-developers of a uh, real-time operating system that runs on the coprocessor. I see. And uh, this is a release product? I mean, I could get this now? Uh, yeah, it's available to developers now. Uh, so by developer, you mean a software developer? That's correct. Not, not, by, not hardware developers then? Or? Well, clearly hardware developers, too. Uh, we have the complete platform, uh, hardware, uh, PAL equations, schematics, uh, everything available for developers. At, uh, and you make that available to the, to the uh, third party? To absolutely, absolutely. Oh, so all the hard stuff is done. I just put something on 68,000 and, and build a product. That's right, and it works. That's the best part. That's, uh, that's very impressive. Well. What, uh, how do you compare today with uh, yesterday? You know, I'm impressed in, in getting the show together with you that, that your life is all software. That, yeah. Uh, most, I mean, there are almost no artifacts. You have tapes, I mean, except for tapes, discs, printouts, every kind of magnetic media I've ever heard of, and some that I, I haven't seen very often. Mm -hmm. And uh, that seems to be what your whole life centers around. Yeah, it's all completely abstract. Uh, it's remarkable because when I was in high school, I was assigned to write a paper on something abstract, and I couldn't think of anything. And of course, it was right in front of me. Uh, now I realize it, I guess. So you bring some examples here of? Yeah, uh, I've got a nine-track tape here. Uh, Just for comparison, uh, how many megabytes does this hold? Oh, in the vicinity of 30 to 40 megabytes. There's some really good stuff down around here. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's hard to see on camera. 30 to 40 <laughs> megabytes, huh? Yeah. And this is uh, how many feet? 2,000 feet? 2,400 feet. 2,400 feet. So yeah. that's half a mile of tape. This is uh, 1,600 BPI. Uh, OK. And well, we'll move up one generation. We've got some uh, three and a half inch floppy disks. Uh, this is a box of around 50, 50, roughly the same capacity as the tape. And, and how many megabytes did you say that is? Around 40. 40 megabytes. So there's about a little, uh, yeah, about 800K on each one of these disks, right? Yeah. Yeah, I usually have one in my pocket. Yeah, right. Now, and uh, this tape backup cartridge also is around 40 megabytes. But it's really hard to show the product of one's labor. You know, you can't get too excited about looking at a uh, 40 megabyte tape cartridge. And, and how many megabytes do you have there? Do I have? I mean, all together in your program library. Oh, probably uh, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, four to 600 megabytes. 600 megabytes. Somewhere around there, yeah. So hundreds of megabytes. Well, that's, that's really interesting. And uh, I see our time's getting short. Um, thanks for visiting us this week on High Tech Heroes. And you're all invited, invited to join us again next week when Brian Gilchrist, a space scientist, will be here to explain the remote tether experiment he will be conducting on an upcoming flight of the space shuttle. He and his research team believe that they will be able to generate a substantial amount of electricity simply by orbiting a wire through the Earth's magnetic field. Be sure to tune in to see a real space scientist. Speaking of future shows, reminds me, if anyone watching knows a technologist who'd be a good future guest on High Tech Heroes, please write us a letter and let us know. Be sure to include your suggested guest name and telephone number, a short description of what kind of techno technological work they've done, and a short description of the interesting project they're currently involved in. Please send your letter to Sherwin Gooch, High Tech Heroes, Foothill College TV Center, 12345 El Monte Road, Los Altos Hills, California, 94022. A little explanation of how we make our program might quell some fears and answer some questions. We're basically a gonzo video production. We don't pretend that we're not in the studio, and we don't do any editing. What you see is what happens when we turn the cameras on. 
So what our guests say can't be taken out of context. You see the entire context. And now that that, that business is taken care of, it brings us to our next, to our thought for the day. <clears throat> Do you know what a catenary is? A catenary is a shape assumed by a hanging chain or string, just like this. Because the string has no resistance to bending, all of the forces are in tension, tangent to the curve of the string. It means along the edge of the string. That is, the string itself has no, only forces the string feels are pulling along the string, the length of the string. If you turn this shape upside down, which I can't do with a string, all of the vertical vectors invert, and you get a catenary arch in which all of the forces are in compression, tangent to the curve. Since many building materials are very strong in compression, large arches of this shape can be built. The gigantic arch in St. Louis, called the Gateway to the West, demonstrates this principle to perfection. But you can't get out of the rain by standing under a string. So this begs the question, is it possible to build a surface that is a dome, shaped something like this, which contains all compression forces tangent to the surface. I believe that it is, and I propose that a curve which is the solution to this problem is the integral of the hyperbolic sine of x squared dx. If anyone in our audience can prove this, we'd like to hear from you. Well, thanks again for being our guest on High Tech Heroes this week, Mark. And uh, it's been really fun talking about uh, these old computers. You know, I've always wondered about, uh, I heard a story about the 1130. It has uh, variable word length, I think, and it had mm -hmm. uh, parity bits. I heard that the first one went into the field, and some programmer said all the protect bits. And the. Sounds like something Richard would do. And they <laughs> had to take the computer back to the factory, because it was all protected. And, uh, and nobody could write a program in it, even to erase the, the protection bits. So I might have done that accidentally. You might have done that? Well. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this week on High Tech Heroes. Be sure to tune in next week where we'll bring you more entertaining information about the people and ideas behind the scenes in high tech industry. And now, this is your announcer, Tony Brzees, wishing you the best of luck and a pleasant summer. Au revoir. This episode of High Tech Heroes has been made possible in part by grants from Jerry Brown and Associates of Saratoga, California, Kinetic Microscience of San Jose, California, Cybernetics Arts of Sunnyvale, California, and Big D Tools of Sunnyvale, California. <laughs>